All right, we're going to um, get started now. Thank you all for your patience uh, this morning. Um, and welcome, welcome to the Wilson Center. Um, very glad to have everyone here today for this conversation on uh, women at the front lines of change. Um, and just an update, we're not gonna be able to live stream this today, um, but we will be recording it, video archive, so for your colleagues who weren't able to attend, we'll be sure to share that recording with everyone and you can pass it around. So even though it's not live, you're still being recorded, so keep that in mind. Um, so just a few quick words uh, where, you're uh, where you're sitting. Uh, the, at the Woodrow Wilson Center is the living formal memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, who was the only president with a PhD. Uh, and so instead of a monument on the mall, you got a think tank. <laughs> and in honor of his founding of the League of Nations, our mission is to bridge the gap between scholarship and policy in the world of international affairs. And uh, we also seek to bridge the gaps between issues too, and particularly my program, the Environmental Change and Security Program, where I, where I serve as the senior writer and editor. We've long uh, championed an interdisciplinary approach uh, to these issues, to looking at the intersections between environment and health uh, and development and security, and, uh, and how those things are connected to our to the larger goals of sustainability and prosperity. So today's topic, women, climate, and displacement, is a perfect example of this kind of challenge that, that we can't understand or tackle with a single sector approach. We, we have to approach it at that intersection where these, that's sort of the center of the Venn diagram where these three things overlap. So I'd really like to thank our partners at the Sierra Club uh, at Gender and Environment Program for working with us today uh, on this to, to really kick off Women's History Month, right? Uh, and they have a number of uh, other uh, uh, activities and events coming up uh, over the course of the month and for International Women's Day next week uh, that I hope you'll check out. Uh, and if you didn't see it, uh, Sierra Club's Jessica Olson wrote a piece today that we published this morning on New Security Beat uh, about these connections and really get, synthesizes um, some of the, uh, all of the aspects we'll, we'll talk about today um, and gives you kind of an overview take of, of what's at that, what's in the middle of that den Venn diagram. So I'm really thrilled today to introduce you to our uh, experts who will share their perspectives on this. And uh, I'm very pleased that we're actually gonna cover a range of approaches as well. We have research, journalism, law and policy here. So uh, a deep, deep bench here of expertise that I hope you will all um, call on. And as I mentioned earlier, they do have to leave pretty quickly right after the end, so we will be shuttling them out. But if you, I uh, encourage all of you to follow up with them uh, afterwards via email or Twitter or, or however, uh, you can, I'd be happy to assist with that as well. Um, so, and I know afterwards we're gonna have a, a really good Q&A, I can already tell. Um, so start thinking now about your questions, make sure they're questions and not speeches. Um, and uh, and uh, the hashtag is uh, women climate that we're gonna use today. So let me um, uh, briefly describe, uh, introduce you to the panelists. I'm not gonna go through their bios because you have them in front of you. Um, Eleanor Blom Blomstrom is the co-director and head of office at the Women's Environment and Development Organization. Uh, Justine Kalma is a multimedia investigative journalist working across the U.S. on environmental justice, global health, and migration. She's currently a fellow with Grist.org and the investigative fund at the Nation Institute. And Verona Kalantis is an intergovernmental specialist at the United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women, or UN Women. And Maxine uh, Burkett is professor of law at the William Ace S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii, and we're very pleased to say a global fellow here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And uh, a huge thanks again to Maxine for, for, for uh, uh, coming in early uh, on Skype to join us, uh, and she will be able to follow uh, this session uh, via the Skype connection today, um, and uh, we will uh, be hearing uh, from her uh, later. So let's start with Eleanor. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you so much to the Wilson Center and to Sierra Club for putting this together and hosting it. It's really great to be here. And I think the, the topic that we're covering today is something that doesn't get enough attention. And I didn't realize Jessica had written something this morning. So I'll look forward to reading it um, after the session here. Um, 
So what, what I'm going to talk about is a project that we worked on last year, specifically related to, <clears throat> as you can see, gender, climate change, and migration in an area called the Dry Corridor of Central America. And I just wanted to start by first telling you a little bit about the Women's Environment and Development Organization and who we are, so you can understand how we approach this and then how this fits into our larger, um, our larger body of work. So we do is a global women's advocacy organization. So our focus is on advocacy, and we're aiming for a just world that promotes and protects human rights, gender equality, and the integrity of the environment. So that's the capsule of what we do does. And we've been working for over 25 years in this space, um, really working on ensuring that women's voice and participation and power and leadership is evident and possible at all levels. And we work really um, alongside many partners and allies, and without those allies and partners in uh, NGOs, governments, the UN, our work would be impossible. So I want to recognize all of them. And I think what's, what's great for us is um, coming to a place like the Wilson Center and connecting to Washington, D.C., is that WeDo was founded by a former congresswoman of New York, Bella Abzug, along with um, luminaries, visionaries, women um, internationally, from Wangari Maathai to Vandana Shiva to Thais Koral and others who really saw this importance of ensuring that women's voice and leadership was, um, was front and center in terms of environmental issues and bringing women's rights and a feminist perspective there. And as Bella said, all issues are women's issues. And I think that that rings true. And we've hear, we're hearing many, um, many politicians now talking about that, which is critical. So, we do a lot of, of work in the international sphere, and then with this specific project, we had a really great opportunity um, to use our intersectional and intersectoral lens to drill down into more of a project view to understand how our climate change and gender and migration or displacement, depending on the word you're using, how are they coming together, who's studying that, what are the impacts. And, um, and so that's what our project was about. And we really liked the idea and the opportunity to do this um, primary research, really. And we wanted to ensure we were bringing a rights-based approach to the project. So I don't think I need to remind any of you, but just in case you don't know, is that climate change is causing widespread destruction, economic, social, cultural, and human suffering around the globe. And we know that, that it, it's affecting everyone, however our different roles in society, women, men, um, people with disabilities, indigenous persons, are all impacted differently. And so we wanted to explore that concept through this particular project and really understand how the, the structural discrimination that women often face is impacting their <clears throat> how they migrate, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> or even if they migrate. And so I will jump right into the project now. And along the way, I tried to include specific pictures from this project. So we were really excited to work together with an organization based in Costa Rica called Copi Solidar. And they're um, a group of professionals who are really focused on working um, on strategies related to conservation and development, and especially working with local communities, with women and indigenous people. And then the, the project itself was commissioned by a group in Spain called Inspiraction. And they're a foundation, and they come together um, with a feminist vision, and one of their main focus areas is climate change. So in the project itself, um, we were guided by three main questions, and they were basically what's, what's there on the screen, what are the dynamics of migration as a result of environmental causes in that region, and how do they affect women and men, what kind of resilience building and adaptation actions are women planning and implementing, and then when, when designing going forward <clears throat> policies at different levels, what needs to be taken into account? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm not sure why my voice is failing me today. Um, and how do we ensure that it's addressed from a feminist perspective in regards to migration and displacement? So the one question you may wonder is, OK, this session is, has displacement in the title, and I keep using the word migration. And we had a real um, challenge, not a challenge, more of a discussion as we were working on the project to decide 
what word would we use? And we thought about both definitions and how the people that we were interviewing were approaching the issue. So we decided to take migration as this larger category that could include both forced and voluntary movement. So that displacement may be part of it. Displacement for us was generally forced. However, in talking to, um, to different groups and people in the region, they seem to categorize displacement as, uh, as within country much more locally and to other cities, and then migration they considered international, even you know beyond the, the area of Central America. So we thought that for us, then it made sense to use migration. And so the context of Central America and the dry corridor in particular um, is, is one that's really, I think it's very challenging in terms of climate change, and it's an area of high climate risk. Um, there's expected to be increased drought, precipitation changes, higher temperatures, changes in diseases and vectors. Um, and then if you look at the global, global climate risk index, all four of the countries we visited, Honduras, Nicaragua, Guatemala, and El Salvador, are in the top 40 in terms of risk. And um, in, in, the, in the region itself, there already were a number of different migratory patterns, and that's been going on for a long time. So it's not as if migration just began because climate change is having more of an impact on the region. And it's always been <clears throat> multi-causal, social, economic, environmental, and the people who go changes, and where they go also is varied. And the, the other thing that we looked at in terms of gender and women was we realized that in the region, um, both in the research and as we were speaking to people, the culture of patriarchy and machismo is extremely strong and very much challenges how women are able to, to take charge of what they're doing. Um, so for example, if you look at something as simple as the wage gap in Nicaragua, research shows that it's 30%, the wage gap, which is quite, quite huge. And that there's a, a large burden of unpaid and domestic care work the women are taking on in the region. So the process, as I've already said, it, we tried to take a feminist approach and really look at uh, participatory research when we were in the region and to take diverse perspectives, understanding that while we're looking at women and men, we also need to be aware of age differences, ethnicities, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, et cetera. Um, and so in that work, we had a desk review and literature, um, sorry, desk research and literature review, and then field work. And the field work took place in May and June of 2017 in the four countries I've mentioned. And we used focus groups, interviews, and site visits to look at projects. And overall, we had participants, uh, 184 men and 67 women. In each country, we chose two main communities. We couldn't see the whole country. We had about a week in each space. It was a small project. Um, but we tried to identify communities that had particular climate impacts as well um, as really were part of this dry corridor, which while they have experienced always a dry climate, it's been getting much more and more um, frequent and long, the droughts that they're facing. So if we look at the findings, um, the, what you see on the screen are sort of the overarching um, information that, that we saw. And it was really complex, all of the variables and how they interrelated. In our research, our desk research, we had trouble finding statistics that were disaggregated by gender or by specifically migration or displacement due to environmental degradation and environmental causes. We found quite a bit of relationship between two of the three variables that we were studying but very rarely all three. And we also noted that when we looked at normative frameworks like the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or the Sustainable Development Goals or others, that they're often also connecting two of the three issues, but not all three together. Um, and in particular, we saw that there are a lot of economically motivated decisions that are being made in countries in terms of um, infrastructure projects or mega hydro projects that are having, um, that are really exacerbating inequalities and impacting how people are moving. And we also saw that women, when they're staying in place, are, are having um, different kinds of projects where if they're leading projects, they tend to be around three main areas, in seed banks and exchanges, in water harvesting, and in organizing women's groups so that they're able to do a number of different things. <clears throat> 
So here are just um, some of the pictures and some of the things that we've found um, in the region. So in this particular community that was in Nicaragua, it was a very um, an impoverished community, and they were struggling because in many in almost every place we went, there used to be two planting seasons. And because of the drought, then there's been only one. So they called it the first and the second season. And the first one had become really unreliable. And therefore, there was a challenge in having enough food to eat. And in many cases, the, the only um, economic activity in the area is really farming, and it's subsistence farming. So the only choice when there's not enough food is to be hungry, to, to cope by changing how you're eating, or to... Um, to migrate, and it's not officially displacement. We didn't really find in, in all of the research that we did in the region itself that people were, were being displaced specifically due to drought because it was such a complex set of issues that were causing women and men to move. But we found um, that there were a, num a number of issues made it more challenging for women to address the issues of drought and that they rarely had um, title to land and access to land, so that the land they were using was often much further away. And to get water to, to that land or back to the household took a lot more time. And so it, I feel like, it, to me, it, it, it made it really clear, much of the research that says women are walking further for water, and it's a real challenge. But um, it was the truth there. And the, the challenge was that women, if they weren't organized and didn't have time to be organized or weren't connected to national groups who were working on issues around land rights and awareness of tenure, um, then, then they weren't really able to effectively come together and lobby for their rights in, in that area. <clears throat> so oftentimes we heard from the people that we visited that both that women were beginning to migrate more um, than they had, both within the country where they lived to cities um, and but also internationally. So it seemed like the changes that were happening is that more women were, um, were going temporarily to local cities for domestic and care work, while um, others were actually moving to Spain. Uh, there had been some, it seemed like some downturn in, in women and men who were coming to the US for domestic and care work, and a larger increase to Europe, given the political situation. So as I said, it wasn't a really clear result that women and men were being displaced, but it was very clear that the challenges of drought um, were, were increasing how people moved and how they thought about it. One of the challenges we saw in the region was that because of the economic insecurity and the lack of um, economic resources, that many who wished to migrate, even temporarily, couldn't even do that because they were not able to put together enough money for the short-term migration. Um, but we do see, we heard a lot of women talking about the, they didn't say the feminization of migration, but what they were seeing um, was that more women in their family were heading to different places and that it was really about care work or it was about working in factories. And so one of the challenges to just point out in this picture, the woman on the top left, she worked with organized labor um, in these places called the Meloneras, and so um, where they were doing lots of growing and processing of melons and ag agro-industrial projects. And women and men faced many challenges in terms of power dynamics and violence in the workplace. And so we saw that the challenges of women being displaced or migrating for work to um, cope with drought um, was, real, was really challenging, and um, they weren't able to exercise their rights in those spaces. But you can see um, one of the other issues that I could talk more about in the Q&A, the, the top middle picture is a solar farm in Honduras. And as we were heading to meet with one of the groups who had helped organize our trip, um, we were really excited to see this, and we thought, oh, this is amazing, the renewable energy. And then when we got there, we found in talking to many different groups that it was very problematic. They had cut down trees that were really important to maintaining um, the water table, and they hadn't asked anyone, and it was impacting the heat that came off of, that radiated off of the solar panels was impacting the local community, and the energy savings they were supposed to be having were they weren't seeing locally. The energy was being exported elsewhere. So it's wrapped up in these challenges um, that we often talk about as false solutions to climate change that can impact um, how people are um, how people are, are addressing climate change in their local areas. So there were people who were displaced from that specific 
spot for this climate change solution. Um, and then they didn't have, they weren't given another place to go that was very effective for them. So here's some other photos from the work. There were many different um, ways that women were coping because we saw, as I said, that while the migration was increasing, many women in, in C2, sort of in the communities where they were, were trying to work together. Um, but resources were often a challenge. And I know my, my time is up, so I won't go into the recommendations, but I can come back to them as we, after we hear from the others and get into questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Uh, the example of unintended consequences, I think, is really important, especially when you're considering the, uh, the gender impacts of, of those um, unintended consequences. Thank you. So now we'll turn uh, to Justine Kalma. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Justine. Thank all right, so first of all, I want to really thank the other panelists here because as a journalist, I really look to you all to inform me, so it's really an honor to sit next to you. Um, and I think what I can contribute because y'all are the experts are just kind of going over some of the narratives that I've come across in my reporting on climate change and gender. Uh, and so I'm going to share with you a little bit from uh, some of the stories that I have worked on in the last couple years uh, and punctuate that with uh, some of the, some of the uh, research that I have relied on to inform my work. So um, my contact information is uh, on the right-hand corner. Uh, if you need to reach me, it's all on my website where you can also find links to the work that I'm talking about. Uh, I'm currently a environmental justice fellow with grist.org, which is a fantastic news site for environmental news and with a specific focus on equity, empowerment, um, and solutions. Uh, and so I really encourage you also to check out grist.org. Um, and on the topic of women, we have a really fantastic cover story right now about sexual harassment um, among, uh, of uh, female scientists uh, going to Anar Antarctica. It's a really powerful piece. Um, but uh, to move forward, I'm going to be talking today largely about climate change and how it's uh, created human trafficking hotspots, particularly um, this is throughout Asia, but my research, uh, my reporting was, was in the Philippines. Um, and so I... Uh, I'll be sharing stories from uh, 2016 when I was in the Philippines uh, working for the Ground Truth Project, which is another nonprofit newsroom. Uh, you can find that on uh, the groundtruthproject.org and our publishing partner, Quartz. Uh, and then some of the photos that you'll see in my presentation are from a photojournalist I, I worked with, Hannah. Reyes Morales, who was also reporting with me for the Ground Truth Project. Um, and then I'll also be highlighting some findings from the International Organization for Migration, which has been an important source in my reporting. So I've, I've put the name of that report here as well. Um, because as a journalist, uh, I really craft my stories around a balance of, uh, of human, human voices and then also um, expert voices as well. And so uh, today I want to talk about when it comes to human trafficking, I'm going to be exploring, uh, one, the short-term or sudden onset effects of climate change brought about by natural disasters like typhoons or hurricanes. Uh, climate change heightens the intensity and frequency of extreme weather events like superstorms, uh, which we've seen uh, in 2017's devastating hurricane season. Uh, and then secondly, I'll also be covering long-term or slow onset effects of climate change like sea level rise and how that exacerbates human trafficking as well. So, uh, so natural disasters increase women's vulnerability to sexual exploitation and human trafficking. Uh, uh, from the IOM report, in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, displacement is likely to occur, giving space for traffickers to operate and exploit affected people, their desire for safety and, uh, and search for means of income to help restore their lives. And this may lead either to a, a sharp rise in human trafficking in the, if the region is already experiencing trafficking in persons or the creation of a new hotspot for human trafficking. And then when it comes to the long-term effects of climate change, um, it destroys livelihoods and places disproportionate bu 
burdens on women and the poor. And we know that women are uh, a majority of the world's poor. Human trafficking thrives where people are uh, desperate and displaced. And uh, from the IOM report, slow onset events are also associated with an increase in trafficking in persons when irreversible damage due to slow onset events occurs, such as in the case of land erosion or repeated droughts. Households may face increased debt and poverty. Increased desperation may push affected populations into the hands of criminal actors and even into colluding with them, as seen in instances of men selling their wives or other female relatives or parents selling their children. And um, these are all issues that I came across uh, in women's lives in the Philippines. So uh, I'm sure we all remember the devastating uh, typh super typhoon Haiyan, known locally as Yolanda, uh, that uh, struck the Philippines in November 2013. The Philippines is one of the countries most vulnerable to climate change. It consistently ranks within the top five nations most prone to extreme weather and natural disasters. Um, and when Haiyan struck, it was at the time the strongest storm in history to ever make landfall. It displaced more than four million people and nearly wiped out the coastal city of Tacloban. Uh, in the immediate aftermath uh, of Haiyan, thousands of people were traveling in and out of the worst hit regions. And that chaotic movement of people along with the breakdown of infrastructure exposed women and children to trafficking and sexual exploitation through prostitution, rape, and assault. Uh, the United States Population Fund I'm sorry, the United Nations Population Fund estimated that 5,000 women were victims of sexual violence in the month following the storm. And the Philippines uh, has, has long struggled to stop human trafficking with an estimated 300 to 400,000 people, mostly women and children, trafficked for sex and labor each year. And climate change is making it um, easier for human traffickers to operate and more difficult for its opponents to respond. Um, so the women in these pictures are, um, they're living in a halfway house in the Philippines. They have been rescued, uh, they've been rescued uh, from a trafficking situation and uh, yeah, their names have been changed uh, for their safety and, and you won't be seeing photo, uh, photos of their faces as well. So Christine, um, she lost everything in the storm. Her family lost their home. Her father, who worked as a carpenter, lost his livelihood. She lost her grandmother, who had raised her and who she felt was her protector in the family, was swept away and killed in the storm. Uh, after the skies cleared, a humanitarian disaster unfolded in the Tacloban Astrodome, a sports arena where thousands took shelter. An underground economy took root as women and girls were sold for food and scarce aid supply or trafficked into forced labor and prostitution by recruiters offering jobs and scholarships. And there, Christine says that her stepmother sold her to men every night, some of whom she believed were foreign aid workers. Um, they raped her, took graphic pictures and videos. Christine was 13. We also know that recently Oxfam um, has released its internal report into allegations of sexual abuse after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. The report confirmed that senior aid workers, uh, including the country director in Haiti, paid for sex at Oxfam property in the aftermath of the disaster. Um, and and I don't think it's um, I, I don't think you know that that only happened in Haiti as as we've seen in Christine's story. Um, and I also want to make note that. She, although she, she was a child, so you know there's no consent there. But regardless of her age, sex trade in the context of catastrophe is exploitation, um, and the global sex trade is built on the sale of poor women and children of color from the global south. And even in um, in their apology, Oxfam International Executive Director Winnie Bianima. Um, said the use of prostitutes in condition of poverty and helplessness and conflict is exploitation. It is abuse, um, and so. Uh, again, turning back to the IOM report, specific attention must be given to the risk of trafficking in persons in camps, camp-like settings established to shelter those displaced by natural disasters. As examples from the Asia Pacific region show, these settings attract criminal actors and can, can become targets for human traffickers. Um, sometimes affected families or individuals may also resort to trafficking or collude with traffickers to earn their money. Um, and so, uh, Social workers for the Department of Social Welfare and Development in the Eastern Visayas, um, where Tacloban is, uh, is seated, reported a threefold increase in the number of trafficked victims, uh, trafficked persons after Haiyan, but still they're largely unable to capture the magnitude of the problem.
All right. Um, after leaving the Tuklo Astro Astrodome, Katrina was trafficked to Manila um, by a family friend where she worked as a domestic worker for little pay and was sometimes locked in a room for days. Um, she, with the help of a neighbor, was able to escape and is now um, at a shelter with Visayan Forum, an NGO that works uh, with traffic, works against trafficking in the Philippines. Um, another story from Tacloban. These are um, two women that I met uh, who were among the lucky survivors of Haiyan, Jenny Rosialda and her friend Eva Ibanez Ingo. They took uh, shelter in the Tacloban Astrodome. Um, where they faced new danger, dangers once the storm passed. Um, Rosialda said, if we dozed off, we would be unaware. It was dangerous for us. We have to make alliances so we can look after each other, woman to woman. They were afraid of being sexually assaulted in common wash areas, so they avoided bathing or urinating alone. They took measures to protect themselves and each other, taking um, turns watching each other while the other sleeps or goes to the restroom. Um, they recall chaotic, chaotic crowds in the shelter when aid was distributed. They say some men were able to to push to the front and collect more goods than others. Some women in dire need of basic necessities resorted to exchanging sex for provisions. Um, Rosialda and Ibanez instead relied on each other for their daily needs. Um, she says their motto was, share your blessings. If I run out of panties, can you lend me some? Um, a solution to that, this was a shelter um, that was recently built in Guwan, uh, another uh, area severely uh, hit by the storm, and it features uh, design. It has design features to prevent exploitation, including uh, clear sight lines throughout the building and ample lighting to minimize gender-based violence, as well as more secure restroom facilities. I have to kind of speed through a little bit here. So I want to talk next about uh, the long-term effects of climate change and how those affect uh, women as well. So this is Durham. Um, it's a very remote island in the Philippines. Three quarters of the population here live in poverty and nearly everyone fishes or farms for their livelihoods. This dependence on the natural environment makes them particularly vulnerable to the immediate threats of extreme weather events and the long-term effects of climate change. Um, Kiana is a, a woman from Durham, a young woman from Durham. She was 17 when I met her. She said, it was, it's difficult in my hometown because people's livelihoods stop. When there's a typhoon, you can't fish. You're not allowed to go to the sea. You can't work in the fields. Um, storms and sea level rise are forcing families um, in Durham to relocate, says a, a local social worker, Alma Lucero. But where can they move, she says. If they will move to the upland area, it's pl prone to landslides. And you can't force them to move because their livelihood is here. Most of them are earning from fishing. So where can we move? To the middle of the sea. Um, Kiana, when she was 11, was trafficked to the Philippines' capital city, Manila, and forced to become a domestic worker. She says her family sold her out of desperation. She fled her abusive employer, but then was soon recruited to work in a bar in the same red light district where her mother had left home to work in. Um, and after being in the bar for less than a year, she was counter-recruited by a Christian NGO, Wipe Every Tear, where she um, is now living in a shelter with them. But uh, she... so. Uh, so these two photos, the top is Durham, um, where unfortunately there has become a, um, a stereotype stigmatizing woman from Durham called Magdalena de Durham, which means like Mary Magdalene of Durham, a, a um, character in the Bible associated with, with sin and prostitution, um, unfortunately. And the bottom is a, a nightclub um, in Angeles City, where there's a red light district um, that cropped up outside of a, U a former U.S. air base, and this is where um, this is where both Kiana and her mother found themselves as bar girls. Uh, and then, lastly, I know I have to um, wrap up quickly. Here is when you're degrading the environment, you're degrading the status of women. Um, Emma Porio, uh, um, someone I suggest you look into her work if you're interested in the Philippines. So. To be resilient is to narrow the gaps across sectors, says Antonia Loizaga of the Manila Observatory, ad addressing disparities in resources, economic and political power, she says, will help women better cope with the threats posed by a warming planet. And then I'm just going to summarize this really briefly because I don't think I have time to get into it. But um, And also because I think Maxine is going to go into this uh, more closely. But uh, I recently reported uh, for Grist on how closed-door policies um, imperil climate migrants. Um, um, 
you know, we're seeing that climate change is increasingly a push factor for migration. Um, however, there's a policy vacuum for addressing the new waves of climate migration, and the only policy in place, temporary protected status, is um, which offers employment authorization and protection for deportation um, for migrants from designated countries experiencing conflict or environmental catastrophe, is the only um, immigration, or not the only policy really um, that can protect specifically environmental migrants, and we've seen that the Trump administ administration has um, chosen not to extend TPS for um, folks from El Salvador, Haiti, Sudan, Nicaragua. Um, and despite that, TPS in itself is also not a long-term solution because it doesn't provide uh, a path to legal residence or citizenship. And in terms of how this affects women in particularly, we know that um, those, hold, those TPS beneficiaries who are no longer, um, you know, once they're no longer TPS beneficiaries, they're, they're eligible for deportation, and deportation really uproots families. And more than 273,000 children born in the U.S. have parents who are TPS beneficiaries. And so when you think about if those their mothers are um, having to find, uh, you know, another way to, um, to leave or exist in this country, that that's going to affect um, the families and the children as well. And... Uh, particularly around um, driving irregular migration and putting migrants' lives on the lines during dangerous um, border crossings is um, one of the results of this policy vacuum. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Justina. Thank you for sharing the voices um, of those women and, and their stories. Um, I was especially uh, struck, well, not only by the by the magnitude and severity of the situation, but but also by the the solution that you shared around the shelter that was specifically designed. That's something I hadn't thought about, and, and as a really concrete outcome of trying to uh, take a small step towards addressing this. Thank you. Uh, now I'll turn to Verona. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, yes. So thank you, um, Megan, and thank you for um, the organizers of uh, this event and uh, also to our guests. This is really very encouraging that there's, uh, it shows so much interest. Um, Eleanor and myself, we go to climate change meetings and meet in New York, and I don't see this uh, much turnout. Uh, so this is really encouraging, uh, especially on, is on an uh, issue which is, um, is there and it's uh, recognized as an issue, but I think is not very um, well um, researched and there's uh, not so many uh, data and, and evidence. And uh, when we do our out outreach, especially with respect to member states, governments, uh, they always ask us for the evidence. So it's, uh, it's, it's good that we're having this discussion and um, I hope that some of you, uh, maybe some of you here who are um, graduate students in the academy will pick up this issue and uh, that will, will, will help us to um, reinforce our voices when we do our, our outreach and our own programming. Um, so I'm with the UN Women. Um, some of you may know, but for those who don't, uh, we are the UN entity that works for gender equality and women's empowerment, and we do it at the global level, intergovernmental, and within the UN system. Uh, we also have policies, programs, and uh, uh, work on data and strengthening the evidence for the issues that we push for. Uh, for this intervention, I will, um, uh, Thank you to Eleanor and to Justine, uh, who have um, more or less uh, built the foundation. It's always easier to be the last speaker because then uh, you can just choose what you want to focus on because the other speakers have already laid the ground, uh, let's say, the groundwork. So I will focus, I'll just go quickly through um, what we what the gender dimensions of climate change is. I mean, that's, uh, that has been touched upon in the example, so we can do that very quickly. And I'll, uh, I'll just get into um, a maybe just um, a, a little bit of an explanation of what it means to be gender responsive. I know we hear this all the time. We hear about concepts such as gender mainstreaming, integration of gender perspective, what are the gender differences and so on. We'll look, in, look into that uh, from the 
from from the theory part of it and also f through agreements intergovernmental agreements and just a little bit of some uh, of our programs in UN women and some stories of resilience um, before, uh, I, I, I want to give some headline messages before I run out of time, so at least you have this uh, <laughs> if, if, if I run out of time. We already know that gender inequalities persist, and we know what, what it means, uh, I, I suppose, but if we don't know what it means, we're not talking about uh, that men and women or boys and girls are equal at, at the same level because we may not be able to reach that, but what we want to see is a situation where they have the same opportunities, they have the same access to resources, um, and it's, uh, the, the roles and responsibilities are not associated uh, on the basis of social constructs, as we know uh, gender is a social construct. Um, women and girls are disproportionately impacted by climate-related threats. We've heard that and uh, some evidence of that. And uh, women and men on the move are subjected to different challenges and needs. Um, and uh, but then the the part that we uh, we've seen and uh, I think we've made progress on this following this issue over the years is the last part where uh, we focus on the second bullet, the disproportionately impacted, the vulnerability, and uh, they picture women and girls as vulnerable. And uh, we forget the third part, which is the agency and leadership. The, vul the vulnerability of women and girls is not because of their nature, but because, but because of the structures, the, the, the opportunities that are not afforded to them, the roles that are assigned to them, that puts them in vulnerable situations. So um, now, um, I, uh, I was trying to make my PowerPoint a little bit more interesting, <laughs> and I did, <laughs> I did some search. You know, if you just do a little Google search, and I, I, I was reading, um, San, uh, what's Lean In, um, Sarah, uh, Cheryl Sandberg, uh, mm -hmm. Lean In, and mm -hmm. she mm -hmm. said uh, there, there was something that struck me there, because said, if you Google a uh, male CEO, nothing is going to come up, and I did it, and it's true, I mean, like, uh, so, uh, we always, we always highlight the first women so-and-so, the, the 50, 50 uh, women, uh, the top top women uh, in Fortune uh, 500 and so on. Uh, so uh, you, you could just see uh, in the roles that are associated, the women perform, especially in developing countries and least developed countries, uh, these, are all, these are all real. And uh, what these do is because they're all associated with and are expected to perform these functions, they lose out on other things that they're supposed to be doing to, to enhance their agency. They are not able to go to school. Girls, even girls, are not able to, to go to school. I explained to my little girl, I have a five, mm -hmm. no, now she's seven. <laughs> it, it, goes, it goes quickly. <laughs> actually behaves like a teenager, but uh, <laughs> anyway, she's five years, uh, seven years old. <laughs> and when I tell her that there are these inequalities, they actually don't understand, because of course in our household we don't, we don't uh, uh, have that, we don't see that. You know, I have a boy and a girl, it happened that way, but you know. But when you explain to them that yes, we have to work on this, because this is not what happens everywhere, and they're surprised, you know. Um, so, uh, but, but this, because of all of these roles that we assign to women and the perceptions and the structural inequalities, uh, it's, it's not only the case that women are um, more burdened in terms of doing the work that are not considered even productive by society, isn't that very <laughs> ironic? They're also, um, as mentioned by Justine, they're also exposed to violence. And uh, we see that uh, even in, especially for women on the move, and I would just like to read a little. Uh, okay, so I'll just go on. So because of all of these structural inequalities, the result is women have no access to almost 
everything. I'm, I'm not, this is a generalization. This is, uh, uh, I know that in some countries it's better than others, but there's no, uh, this is something certain we can say, and Eleanor, I think uh, we can say this together, that there's no country that can claim that they have perfect equality, right? Yeah, we're still in that. Uh, Norway is, I think, at almost there, but we're not there yet. So no access in terms of decision-making power, no access to resources. Um, um, Eleanor mentioned about land, uh, no access to land, land rights. Some can't even um, have money, uh, like a paper money, holding money, or <laughs> they cannot access uh, bank accounts, uh, no loans, and so on. So, okay, I, I am, I'm with my three minutes. Uh, very interesting background things there, but let me go on. Uh, so these are just um, climate-related disasters and female for mortality. It has been mentioned, but just to give you the figures, uh, you can have a <coughs> look at this. In, um, in the slide. Uh, and now I was mentioning about women being, uh, face human rights violations during migration, not just during migration, but also at their destination. Um, they lack resources, they don't have adequate uh, health services, including sexual and reproductive health services, which are very important. Uh, problem accessing employment, no social security protection, education, housing. Sometimes they, they, they don't have legal documents, uh, and, and therefore um, we say that migrant women and girls are subject to all of these intersectional forms of discrimination. So uh, because of poverty, because of being a woman, because of being a woman of color, because of women without education. Um, so now let me just show you this slide. Uh, you may know um, it has been mentioned already, the 2030 Development Agenda. yoo we have one goal for ourselves. Uh, is that something to celebrate? Maybe yes, maybe not. Uh, so this is the goal. And I just want to show you this. Uh, um, Eleanor mentioned about Nexus, and Megan also um, mentioned about Nexus. Uh, so um, they did some... Okay, some this nice diagram on how gen with when you achieve gender equality, you also contribute to achieving these other goals of the SDGs. I mean, I would say it's more. I mean, this is a conservative way of projecting it, but uh, I don't have the technological capacity to add the other things. Uh, maybe my 10-year-old boy can help me one day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so those are just two. now. Let's just just to go quickly on these gender responsive approaches. So now what we're saying is we want to mainstream gender as a strategy, which means to say that we don't look at gender equality just as an issue by itself, but that when we look at with climate change, when we were doing climate change, they say, what's the difference? Uh, how does women, uh, how does women participate, women's participation contribute to climate change, or why do we need to have a, a differenti differentiated understanding or analysis of, of gender, uh, of climate change from a gender perspective? Uh, so, but, but we need to, uh, because we have to have that, what we call a gender lens. Uh, we have to take account of women's uh, special needs uh, and, and uh, what their burdens are, because again, going back to the structural inequalities that I mentioned earlier on. So gender mainstreaming is a process of assessing the implications for women and men of any planned action, legislation, policies, programs, in any area and at all levels. So uh, we can't we can uh, we can't assume that that the thematic experts know. We can't assume that those who are following environmental issues will take up gender issues. That those who are understanding uh, the refugees, displacement, migration will take up gender issues because uh, they may be well intentioned. They're, they they're not against it, but they will not take it on board necessarily. So there is something that needs to. And then uh, on the gender, uh, here gender analysis informs all of these uh, interventions. Uh, the thing that I really want to highlight is when we say in all areas, at all levels, and all types of actions, I indicated there. 
at the, at the intergovernmental level when they're doing their negotiations. This is what Eleanor and myself do. Uh, and I think we're doing it effectively because we have a lot of language there already, but it has to be translated at the national level through policies within the UN, through policies, programs, and budgets. Budgets is very important because then at the end of the day, we all, we, we all get these answers. We don't have the money. Even within the UN system, they say they don't have the money to carry out all these things. Um, let me just uh, mention about this general recommendation 37, uh, CEDAW general recommendation. CEDAW is the Committee uh, on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, and there now, th this is a soft law, okay? It's not, it's not a convention. It's not something you can really, but as a soft law, it's still important because it's, um, it, it is an authoritative interpretation of treaty norms, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against, uh, of all discrimination against women and girls. And uh, they're, they're adopting for the, first, for the first time a general recommendation which is uh, on the gender dimensions of disaster risk reduction and in the context of climate change. Uh, I think that's great. That's a great piece of normative guidance. Uh, I'm not gonna read to you, they're, they're in the slides. But again, the, at the end of the day, um, the story is the implementation side. But at least you have that tool. And you know that you can use that to do your lobbying, your advocacy, reach out to your governments, and, and so on. Um, just to mention one of our programs, this is a Leadership, Empowerment, Access, and Protection in Crisis Response, LEAP. Uh, and this uh, goes back to what uh, our colleagues here also have mentioned about looking at the multidimensionality of the problem and also the response. So uh, in UN Women, we look at, uh, when we look at climate change, you can't see necessarily that we're working on climate change because our work on climate change is actually uh, wrapped up uh, in um, a livelihood project or a women's empowerment project or uh, women's uh, participation, enhancing women's leadership and women's participation project. So this is what this program uh, um, would uh, uh, aim to do. And this is just an example. I'll flash it there. Again, it's in the slides. So this is an example of a success story, an impact story uh, of how the program has made a difference to a woman in uh, the DRC uh, through giving land titles, uh, which then contributed to the, the woman's and her family's uh, having a business and uh, contributing to entrepreneurship. So I, I think I'll stop there and I'll give um, more, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll answer some questions, elaborate on those uh, later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Verona. It was great to hear a little bit about the policy um, progress and, uh, and, and of course, for bringing up the very, very critical issue of budgets and, uh, and how to go about doing that, especially when, when maybe your project, as you said, is, uh, isn't called a climate project, um, but really does uh, help with climate. How do you access that, that kind of financing? Um, so thanks for, for, that, for going over that. Now we're going to um, uh, turn to Maxine. Hello, Maxine. Eric, um, let's see. I don't know if we can hear you yet. We'll see. Yep. Good oh, morning. great. Wonderful. I'm Hi. so glad this works. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thanks. Great. <laughs> All right. Well, please, um, I'm looking forward to, to hearing from you, and thank you so much for getting up so early again. My pleasure. It's 5.30 now, so that's okay. much better. <laughs> a bit more awake. Time. <laughs> Aloha, everyone, and welcome to my home office. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to join the conversation. Um, this is truly a, a global conversation as I, as I beam in from 5,000 miles away and um, hope to sort of illuminate a little bit of the law and policy that's been alluded to in the uh, earlier discussions by our panelists. Um, I'm going to go ahead and set my timer, Megan, so that you won't have to fret about 
how long I, I might be going as a law professor that <laughs> often is an issue. Um, Thank you. So what else? What I'll do in the next ten minutes is uh, try to sort of provide a, a very sort of sweeping overview of what the current law and policy landscape looks like for the issue of migration and uh, climate change. I'll give one specific example of the experience of Carteret Islanders. Uh, and this one I think is particularly illustrative because of the fact that uh, the, the leadership with respect to making that transition was, um, was notable because it was a, a woman who I think provides a, an excellent example of how um, we could uh, carefully, thoughtfully, but with uh, force, uh, attempt to make transitions that are um, just and uh, properly funded. And then I have a few closing thoughts about some of the gaps that were mentioned. Again, I also benefit from being the last panelist and can refer back to a, a number of, of the important um, bits of information that were shared, uh, uh, particularly with respect to the, the need for adequacy in budgets, the understanding about sex aggregated data and the lack thereof and what that does for our uh, larger issues of um, law and policy um, reform and in some case generation. Um, so I just want to first say that there are, there's sort of been a flurry of activity at the periphery of the Framework Convention on Climate Change to address climate change induced migration. Uh, it's as, as early as 2001 in the National Adaptation Programs of Action, there were attempts to address migration. There have been initial mentions in peripheral uh, conference of parties. This is the Framework Convention meet, annual meetings, peripheral uh, uh, COP documents. Um, there's also been uh, in, intergovernmental efforts uh, like the 2012 Nansen Initiative that have attempted to uh, respond to the issue of climate-induced migration. And um, from what we know about the intensity of the issue, that's still not enough. Uh, but certainly it's important to note that there are a number of of, in some ways, disaggregated themselves, efforts to work on human mobility. There's even um, indication of human mobility in the um, nationally determined contributions as part of the responses to uh, and preparation for the COP21. The Paris Agreement was the result of that. There were at least 33 submissions that referred to migration in some form at the country level. At the Bahamas had it mentioned, Colombia, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, obviously these places that are uh, understood to be at the front lines of this issue of climate-induced migration. And the efforts there were to reduce climate change as a push factor to explore migration as adaptation to leverage remittances, which are a big part of especially cross-border migration and the what's uh, understood to be some of the advantages of that. Within the Framework Convention itself, there have been um, some efforts, somewhat belated. It was first um, mentioned formally in the uh, Cancun agreements in 2010. Um, and uh, I think we all look to the Framework Convention because the convention is the sort of convening of international parties. And uh, at that level, we hope to address some major issues that come out of, of climate change. And of course, we know that migration was understood to be one of the gravest effects of climate change uh, as early as uh, 1990 with the IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Changes uh, assessment of that. And that was based on the notion that we have uh, a number of people moving from sensitive places to other sensitive places. And so so the delay in response has been notable, uh, but in 2015, at, uh, in the Paris decision, paragraph 49, there was an establishment of a task force that was formally um, uh, requested of the executive committee and the Warsaw International Mechanism, and its charge was to develop recommendations for integrated approaches to avert, minimize, and address displacement related to the adverse effects of climate change. So there is some formal recognition. Um, I mentioned the Nansen Initiative earlier as well, and that's important um, because this was a bottom-up consultative process um, initiated by the Norwegian and Swiss governments, but it, uh, it resulted in the a protection agenda for disaster displacement um, launched in, in May of 2016 and has been referred to uh, frequently as a sort of, uh, I think, a gold standard of, um, of extra legal, in terms of formal processes, ways of understanding how we can navigate uh, a climate change uh, uh, affected future with respect to disaster displacement. I also want to identify, again, as, as current law and policy efforts that I think are worth noting, and obviously have implications for all of us, and particularly for women, uh, the, the, the forefront, the countries that are at the forefront of this conversation, and New Zealand is one of them. Uh, New Zealand has been cited largely because of uh, cases that have been tagged as climate-induced migration cases, <clears throat> although, 
uh, at least the most recent with respect to a family from Tuvalu. Uh, it's not clear that climate change was what the case turned on. But suffice it to say, New Zealand courts have actually uh, addressed this question, this question in some respect. Um, <clears throat> uh, not success, this question in some respect. Um, <clears throat> uh, not successfully. The climate change arguments haven't advanced successfully in terms of uh, justifying um, immigration into the country, uh, but it did allow for really, uh, I think, a uh, fascinating and important uh, distillation of the major concerns around um, where the law policy is lacking, or at least uh, where sort of human rights registers, for example, will not fill the gaps for um, New Zealand also is for those that are seeking refuge in another country. New Zealand also is notable because it has uh, established a refugee visa proposal uh, based on climate change, a climate refugee proposal, and this is uh, has the advent of this is as uh, the coincidence there's a new government, a progressive government that is looking at climate change issues and wants to explore the issue of climate, uh, climate refugee visa status uh, that with it will have a number of uh, thorny questions, I'm sure, but uh, my, my sense is that it's better than the alternative, which is to not have any uh, approach uh, initiated at, at all, especially given its, um, its location in the Pacific. Now, that's what we understand to be happening in Denver. Of course, there are a number of outstanding and senior questions, so the, the things that we uh, we, we need to understand as an initial matter before we get into the, the weeds of how we execute on the, on the law and policy at the uh, international or the domestic and subnational level. Um, the first is, of course, that, that we talk about climate refugees. We still see that language being used, but from a legal perspective, that's not an appropriate uh, uh, term to use. And so we uh, can look at the refugee convention, the definition of a refugee. This is uh, this is obviously referring to a different kind of scenario. I can say more about it. Sometimes it might intersect with climate change um, impacts, but for the most part, we're looking at issues of persecution, you're looking at political status, you're looking at uh, situations of migration in which uh, your country uh, does not want to or cannot protect you from whatever the the uh, negative impacts that you're experiencing are. Um, the other issue, besides not really having a way to describe this, and I said, Eleanor sort of referenced, you know, do you talk about migration, do you talk about displacement? So again, using the umbrella term migration, the other issue besides not having a clear legal definition is the fact that we have uh, no clear uh, sense of how many people there are. And I think that was a, a definitely um, illuminated in earlier discussions just simply because so much of this happens in the dark. Uh, so much of the, the impacts of migration um, are not seen or are in the shadows of, of a very chaotic first initial disaster. <clears throat> so um, we don't even actually know the numbers. There are um, estimates from 25 million to 1 billion. I've recently seen 2 billion as an estimate of the number of people that will be migrating as a result of climate change. That is a difference um, of, by, that, that's a, those numbers are, are vary by a factor of 40. And I share with my students that um, that's a really impossible number to uh, plan around, much less put budgets around or have adequate funding for. And uh, it would be as if my husband was um, saying we're going to have a dinner party next week. Uh, it could be 25, 100,000, 10, plus a lot. Right? These are not viable numbers for planning, and so that makes it difficult. But also, uh, it, it's difficult for policymakers and, again, and, and funders, and even with the best intention that are looking very clearly at this, to plan appropriately and to fund appropriately. And so, um, just to just to sort of transition with that note, uh, to talk about what happened with the with the Carter Islanders, we can understand why it's um, important to think about uh, how we we fund uh, and how we describe the impacts of climate change. A number of the difficulties that were mentioned earlier are based on the fact that, for example, drought is a slow onset event. Uh, so is sea level rise. And in fact, what we saw in the Carter Islands was a more of a tale of things to come. That there are other sea level rise certainly was. In, Part of why uh, this atoll island community had to uh, uh, look to to migrate. I'm not sure if you can see me. I can no longer see all of you, but I'm hoping we're still connected. We can still um, see you. Continues with that yeah. assumption. Um, <clears throat> in any event, the Carter Islands uh, a scenario is one in which we saw a, a matrilineal society, society having to navigate 
uh, migration of its people from the atoll to the mainland Bougainville. And Ursula Rakova it was the executive director of Tulele Pesa, which was the community organization. It's the meaning of the, of the name was uh, sailing the waves on our own. And we saw this uh, a very powerful woman uh, leading the permanent resettlement to Bougainville of herself and her family and her, and, uh, uh, the, her community of people. And of course, um, at this, at the point of, of of making the decision and executing on the relocation, there are issues of adequate funding um, that arise, would arise, uh, and as well as the um, difficulties of, of determining issues of land ownership, um, home building, sustainable economic development once resettling. And at the helm of this, uh, this uh, there was a clear. Ursula would articulate clear difficulties with respect to um, funding some of the opportunities that would uh, would would make them more resilient in the face of the typical issues that uh, come up when people migrate, landlessness, unemployment, homelessness, marginalization, food insecurity, lack of access to common property, which sort of footnoted is an issue that certainly Barbuda is uh, dealing with currently. Uh, issues of social disintegration are also quite significant. And again, we have a, a scenario in which uh, there, there isn't adequate funding, but more so there isn't funding that allows for the intersectional, na, intersectionality of the experience to be funded. So is this a development issue? Is this a climate issue? Uh, is this a, a, a women's rights issue? Um, we have, unfortunately, um, a number of policy arenas and in the law siloed these very integrated experiences, right? People don't live as a development, uh, uh, someone who needs development funding versus someone who is a, a woman needing, you know, equal access. Uh, we live in these um, intersectional experiences. So that is an, uh, was a, a, an issue that um, affected their opportunity to move seamlessly. And uh, we know, generally speaking, a number of communities can sit in the legal gaps, whether it's the absence of appropriate legal definitions, in the economic development gaps, because their redevelopment needs fail to be strictly climate or development, uh, that classification for funding is uh, a significant gulf that we need to address. Uh, there are, though, other opportunities uh, and avenues for searching um, for responses that are appropriate for um, responding to the particular needs of women. And I wanted to just highlight a couple uh, bright spots that I was able to identify uh, through uh, uh, NGOs that are looking specifically at how we might address this issue more appropriately. Uh, one is uh, the Women Initiative on Climate Change in the Niger Delta, which is using funds to promote increased knowledge of journalists on, on climate change from a women's rights perspective. And it's recognizing that, they're, that women are particularly threatened by climate impacts generally, but especially during emergencies, disaster, and conflicts that are related. They're often left to suffer displacement displacement, loss of property, widowhood, loss of children, all at the same time of, as being uh, usually disproportionately burdened for the, with the responsibility of taking care of other family members. And so the funding for this particular uh, group was looking to address the, the fact that women are left out of conversations on disaster risk reduction and media reports that don't make visible the disproportionate impacts on women. Of course, um, Justine's work not included, right, because she's doing that. Um, but this organization is led by indigenous women. It's uh, it's allowing for funding that supports information and strategy meetings with women and journalists. There are also organizations like LILAC, which is based in the Philippines, the Purple Action for Indigenous Women's Rights. And uh, after Super Typhoon Yolanda, which was mentioned uh, in 2013, it was also evident that in addition to these um, incredible burdens that women experience, that indigenous women were also first responders in their communities. And so LILAC is now working with indigenous women uh, in those communities to equip them with the knowledge and skills to uh, respond to future disasters and importantly, and I think an important uh, dimension of this discussion, avoid displacement in the first place. So how do we stay in place? How do we uh, create the scenarios in which migration is no longer necessary? Um, so in closing, I just say that there are a couple of takeaways. Obviously, uh, the lack of or diminished visibility of impacts of climate change and migration on women is a, is a massive one. Some of this is an issue of labeling or correctly tagging the phenomenon um, given existing silos. Uh, some of it is also, as mentioned earlier, uh, about the lack of sex disaggregated data. We don't know exactly how women are experiencing this. Also, a lot is lost in post-disaster chaos. So disasters are the situations in which we most clearly see climate change impacting displacement. But uh, so much is, is lost because of, of um, 
uh, the, the trauma and the swiftness with which people respond to the specific disasters. And then, of course, that's something to say about the slow onset disasters that are uh, creeping issues that we're not able to, to fully appreciate. And then lastly, I, I just wanted to share a quick story um, of um, uh, the way in which I've been uh, advised to think about uh, how circumstances uh, happen on, on the ground, certainly if they're distant in time or space. And uh, when looking back on history, we can see a number of it impacts and images that uh, share stories that are quite heartrending. Uh, and they might be uh, those, especially in Hawaii, that, that I've been exposed to that have been these black and white images of dispossession and uh, 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 disproportionate impact. And these are black and white images, and of course, life is lived in color. And so we know that even in stories with respect to women and impacts of climate, that there are a number of uplifting stories that we can, uh, I think, shine the light on. And Ursula Rakova is an example of that, not only because she was able to so powerfully advance the issues of her, of her community, but she did so in the most uh, vibrant and, and a joyful way, um, one that really belied my understanding of how I would imagine her experience to be having to move her community. But she really taught me a lot about what resilience would look like, and joy and laughter uh, is a big part of that. So I'd just like to, to close with that, and I look forward to questions and our Thank discussion. You. Thank you so much, Thank you. Maxine. That was fantastic. And um, I especially was... Um, uh, in, intrigued by your call for intersectional funding. We, we often talk about integrated funding, but I, I, I'd never heard intersectional funding, and I think that's a great way to start thinking about it and, and um, pushing forward. So now I know I have a lot of questions, so I'm sure you guys do. So uh, my colleagues in the uh, back have microphones. Please wait for the microphone uh, and uh, introduce yourself and give your affiliation. And I know we're gonna have a lot of questions, so please stick uh, two questions uh, if you can. Um, so who would like to, who has the first question? Uh, right here in the stripes, hurt. Hi, uh, my name is mm -hmm. Jesse <laughs> Pinchoff. I'm a researcher at the Population Council. So thank you for your presentations. We're doing a lot of work to try to figure out the gaps in the evidence. And so this was really helpful to hear all of your perspectives and see how we can contribute from the data uh, side of things. Uh, my question was just sort of to get, and you have all very like diverse backgrounds and opinions on sort of the offset between promoting policies around migration versus around adaptation, especially with some of the slower onset um, events, and especially as we're all working in resource constrained settings, um, how you can make decisions around um, what to promote, like which policies to promote in that. So a question about priorities. So. You want to go first? Um, let's just do this one because I think it's a good one for all of you to, to think about, and then we'll, we'll take a few at a time later. So. Um, I think that's a really good question. And <clears throat> once again, my voice, apologies. Um, when we think about it at We Do from a rights based and, and feminist perspective, it it's as uh, Maxine, I think, said at the end that really, how do we avoid moving? How do we avoid the migration and, and work on creating better livelihoods, better life where we are? So I think that we would prioritize that, and so therefore that's adaptation, but recognizing also the issue that um, there is this big um, concept of loss and damage. There are times when you just can't adapt and staying would risk lives, so something needs to happen. And from our perspective, then, we really need stronger and better policy on what is that. If we're talking about climate-induced migration, how can that be done in a rights-based way? How are women really part of that conversation from the start? You know, what lessons can we take from Ursula's experience in the Carteret Islands? She's someone that we all know from the climate change negotiations and is an amazing woman. But there's not enough information like that out there in the public sphere to build on. Um, I think the other big elephant in the room, really, it's not just about adaptation. It's about historical responsibility for climate change and who, who is funding this, who has caused it, how are we thinking about it from a justice lens as well. We can't say, all right, you know, you're in this small island state, what are you doing to adapt to sea level rise? What are we doing in, in, the, in the north and the developed countries to 
build the technologies to support that in a rights-based way that's actually looking at making sure we don't have some of the unintended consequences that I mentioned um, from the solar farms before. Thanks. Uh, Bruno, Justine, you know, for a I think I should d defer to the other panelists when it comes to policy. <laughs> well, um, I think um, the way to address it uh, is uh, what we already mentioned about multidimensionality and intersectionality because we and you as researchers, we as recipients of the research that you do and, and also in our programs, um, we, n we now know what the issues are um, and maybe not the whole picture of everything but we know uh, what's kind of intervention will respond to a um, number of, like the way when, when I showed about gender equality for us, because we promote gender equality in women's empowerment, we want to think that gender equality uh, and uh, the achievement of gender equality and women's empowerment should be the nexus. Uh, if you address that, you, know, you empower women, you look at uh, vulnerabilities, you look at uh, the inequalities, then you are able to build capacities so when migration needs to happen or has to happen, uh, there are capacities that are, are already built. Um, and th there's also something around livelihoods that, again, that relates to building capacity, which then also impacts on the decision to migrate or not to migrate. Of course, as uh, Eleanor said, there, there are things that can't really be avoided uh, when it comes to um, islands or, or countries that are really vulnerable to uh, the impacts of climate change uh, as the example uh, given to us on the, um, the Bougainville experience. But yeah, the, the response for me is look at it really at the, the multidimensional um, angle. Maxine, do you As have, go ahead, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll just I'll just chime in and say that you know there it's there are, are like twelve number one priorities probably <laughs> from the perspective of the law, but the first is a framing issue, which is that um, <clears throat> well we, we I don't think we we fully appreciate uh, what makes climate change different, um, and a lot of the discussion has been about how to understand survival migration as distinct from climate migration, and uh, and whether or not that that ought to be the case. But of course, for reasons that Eleanor mentioned with respect to historical emissions, this is a, as much a geopolitical phenomenon as it is a geophysical one in that it, it has, um, there is a cause of it. It's not sort of mother nature gone awry. We have actually juiced the system in that respect. So, we, you know, having the, the international community uh, have responses that reflect that, it, there's language, there's good language about it, but actually an execution at all levels is really critical as well. But also really appreciating that the, that climate change as a, as a phenomenon is so profoundly dynamic and it's not just that climate change impacts are increasing, but the, the rate of change is increasing, right? This is a very different kind of driver uh, that's quite, um, that we've unleashed, in, in other words. And the other issue, <clears throat> if, if, before we even get to this more sophisticated conversation about what climate change is, we're still having very siloed discussions at very simplistically about both climate change and migration, certainly around gender equality. I mean, gender as a social construct is absolutely something that we might all understand as a, as a clear premise for this conversation. But I don't know that that's fully um, integrated in our larger discussions. And so um, even if we just take climate and migration, I think one of the priorities is understanding how the two relate to each other and really teasing that out for the for the general public, because we might we might continue to have these very, I think, um, uh, ham-handed and, and unsophisticated conversations about immigration in the U.S., for example, without understanding the food security pressures that climate change has introduced that are forcing uh, cross-border migration. So I, I don't think we, even if at the, when we're talking about the southern border and, and walls and such that the, the fact that our uh, in, in how we've influenced the changes in climate are, are affecting everyone's day-to-day -day lives is, is all part and parcel. So that connection needs to be more clearly made. Thank you. Okay, let's take some more questions. Are you there in the back? Hi, um, my name is Jenny Baca. I work at USAID. Um, and I'm very interested in this intersection between gender, climate change, and resilience. But one of the things that I've encountered a lot in the reading and the programming um, is that in trying to highlight women's specific experience and difficulty resulting from climate change. 
um, and to bring their voices into leadership positions, a lot of the times we're reinforcing women as source of volunteer labor and women as source of unpaid labor. Um, and I would love to hear the panelists' opinion on how can we go about bringing women's voices into the center of our discussions on how to respond to climate change without reinforcing that role. Thank you. It's a great question about the time burden. Is there a, another one I would put into the mix at the same time? All right, we'll start with that one. If we had some thoughts on that. <laughs> Shall I go first again? Yes. Um, okay, great question. Um, and it's something that we have to grapple with. You know, we, it, I think as Verona was showing, we've seen women portrayed as vulnerable and then women as agents of change, but where is the recognition of the unpaid, um, unpaid labor of women? And it's, it's hard to incorporate that. Um, as a quick anecdote, I was trying to ask this question, I can't quite remember where it was now, and I, and I said, so, you know, if the, if the women who are participating, I think it was related to disasters, are, um, are volunteering their time, how is that impacting on the rest of their life? Are they feeling that that is sort of too much, you know, that they have this triple shift of doing their, their work, whether it's formal and informal, then their household work, and then volunteering in the community? And the person there said, no, they love it. They're so happy to help. And I just thought, I'm not, you know, I don't know. I'm not in that community, and I can't. I can't tell, but um, we do in some other organizations, Sierra Club and UN Women, and when we're working in, in the international climate and policy sphere, and we're trying to think of what are gender just solutions. There's a publication from the Women and Gender Constituency that tries, that reaches out to um, our networks and the movement to identify what are women's groups doing, but some of the um, requirements for putting forward a a project is that it doesn't add to the unpaid work burden, that it equally benefits women, men, and others in the community, and that it does something to change gender relations. So it's, um, I think it's often too simplified, exactly. And there can be policy responses on a local level if government, local municipalities are working on a project, and how, what is the time of the meetings, and how is there compensation to women's groups or to those who are participating? It's just, it's not something that's front and center. It is often expected that women care more, and therefore women are going to, to volunteer and be the saviors. When, as we've said before, just like the countries that have not necessarily been the main contributors to climate change are dealing with the impacts. Women who have not been in charge of much of the economic structures that have contributed to it are then being asked to bear the, the brunt of taking care of it. So um, it's a good question. I hope someone has a uh, more positive <laughs> answer than me. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think um, when you build capacity, because um, when, when, when you engage these women, uh, they may start, let's say, as as volunteers just because they are nice and uh, they are <laughs> we're, we're, we're happy to step up. But I don't think we stop there, right? I don't know. Uh, if if we, you just put your own experience, but we also have, um, we've done work in the field that show that when you build capacity, the the, the women, you're, you're building capacity, let's say it's a leadership training or skills training for to better prepare for natural disasters. Um, to prepare themselves, that's the intention. But then, because they, they have gained confidence in themselves in the meantime, and they've acquired all of these skills, and um, you sensitize them about uh, what they can do and they cannot do. Uh, we have one experience in Vietnam, which uh, we, we really want to give as an example, is strengthening women's capacity in disaster risk reduction to cope with climate change. It started as, just as a project so that women uh, and girls are able to look after themselves rather than thinking about who to save first before themselves, right? So it started with that. But with these women then being, uh, being given a voice uh, and, and this opportunity to be able to uh, exercise some form of power, uh, even if it starts from themselves, um, they started to organize themselves in a union, in the, the Vietnam Women's Union, and then uh, some of them were able to get a seat uh, and, 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 and a position, uh, a voice in the Central Committee for Natural 
disaster prevention uh, and control. So you know, th it, there is there is a progression. I don't think when you start uh, helping women, they become volunteers and they stop there. I, I, and we've seen also some examples in our projects where uh, you give them some startup um, fund to create a business and they move it forward. They create other uh, communities helping other women, but in a productive way. So uh, I, I, I don't think it stops there, so um, yeah. I'll just, um, oh, go ahead, Justine, you go oh, first. Thanks. I would just say um, a, a colleague of mine once told me true diversity is the sharing of power. So I think in terms of thinking about um, how the labor is divided, is the labor divided along with power? And um, I think that shifts the dynamic as well. Yeah, thank you. I, I was, um, it's interesting. This is a great question for me because you can think about a lot of analogs in your own life. I mean, it, it, a lot of times the volunteer labor that women do around schools or, or other things is sort of, it's devalued because it is, is it because women do it? Is it because it's not paid? What, why is it seen as sort of less, uh, you know, lesser than uh, the paid work? that men often do, and, and reproducing that um, may be detrimental both to the women and to the work itself is seen as less important because it is also volunteer work. On the other hand, um, you know, I, uh, I've heard uh, a lot from other people too about the capacity building, and you can see that in our own lives here as well. Women who lead the PTA, those are transferable skills. You know, you can go on and run an organization with that same, you can herd the, all those cats of all those parents, you know. So there's the training element is the very real as well. well but I did hear one uh, uh, story when I was at the World Conservation Congress um, a couple of years ago, and they were talking about gender integration and conservation programs, and a woman from Malawi stood up and she said, you know, uh, they, this is, you say you're paying women to participate in this conservation program and thus you're empowering them, but if they go home and their husbands take the money when they walk in the door, have you really paid the women, you know? And so also understanding, even when it is paid labor, who actually gets to control the money is, um, is a critical part. So there's, there's a lot there. Um, so thank you for the question. Uh, uh, more questions? Uh, right up here. Hi, Michelle Deauville. I'm a doctoral student at Howard University. Um, and I'm actually doing my dissertation on climate change, more specifically sea level rise. And I'm very, I think this conversation is very awesome uh, as it relates to migration and displacement because oftentimes I see that the conversation is centered around adaptation and resiliency. Um, and so as it relates to my dissertation, it's on coastal communities, their risk perceptions, their attachment, and more specifically like will they, are, are, will they, are they conceptualizing the risk, but more so, are they open to voluntarily migrating um, from these communities? Um, and so my question is, I recently went to a workshop where the professor was talking about sea level rise. Um, however, the community had just invested $2 million into infrastructure to adapt to the sea level rise. And I asked him after the workshop, well, what about migration and sea level projections within the next 50 to 100 years project that this community won't even be here? And he said, this is a tough conversation and it's hard to have that with this community specifically and probably a lot of coastal communities because right now they're trying to invest in adapting to these issues um, so we can't tell them like oh actually within the next 50 to 100 years it won't be there so what are you guys going to do now um, and so my question is have you guys had that conversation with communities how does it go what language should we be using when we're uh, speaking to individuals because this is their livelihoods they are attached to these places and so we don't want to come in as researchers and scientists and like actually the sea level projections but like what, what is some advice you would give me as I'm conducting my research to communities Great, and there was one more over here. We'll get the two at the same time. My uh, question is very similar to yours. I'm Deborah Butler. I'm with uh, UMass Boston. I just finished uh, migration research on the Gulf Coast. And my question is, it's more of a, a request than a question. Uh, because as we talk about um, global change, I mean global um, sea rise and, and, the, and the challenges that women face, I'd also like you to consider 
women of color and indigenous people in the United States who are facing these same challenges and include them in your research because I live on the Gulf Coast. I've been doing research with tribal communities and indigenous communities and I'm also living in Boston and we have exactly the same issues. Um, how women in communities of color are not being included and we faced exactly the same challenges with dislocation and migration. So it, if we could include that and I think um, whatever solutions we come up with or whatever uh, adaptation strategies we come up with um, serve as um, exemplars for the rest of the world. So it may be because we have the resources, it may be up to us to actually get something done and show everybody else that it can be done. Thank you very much. So great reminder about environmental justice here in the U.S. and a question about working with communities and um, how to address the existential threats that they face. So if I could mm -hmm. Please chime go. in, especially because I think I was uh, supposed to meet one of the questioners at a conference that we held out here <laughs> in Hawaii. Um, uh, uh, it was a symposium on, on displacement, migration, and relocation that we had uh, at the University of Hawaii co-hosted with uh, Alaska Sea Grant, Hawaii Sea Grant. But importantly, at the time, the White House Council on Environmental Quality, this was December of 2016, so in the sort of the waning hours of the Obama administration. And it's there's very much a domestic conversation that we could spend another two hours uh, really delving into and, and more. Uh, because there's so many complexities there. So I just want to first affirm the, 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 the comments and, and question as uh, very real issues that, that deserve even more attention uh, than they're, they're currently getting. The over, and, and, and frankly, um, the sort of interesting element of this is that although there are such diverse and distinct experiences, the experience, for example, of Pacific Islanders and what's happening in the, in the sort of continental US is, uh, is there are a number of overlaps that I think uh, we can benefit from in terms of shared experience and responses. And, um, and I will say that answering the question of what is the just response uh, has always been difficult and is now even more difficult as we sort of peer into the future. And so for the doctoral student, when you're talking to a community, and I've had these kinds of conversations, 50 to 100 years is uh, is not insignificant. And it's it's almost a lifetime. In some, I mean, it certainly is a lifetime in terms of human scales, um, in, terms of, in terms of the built environment even um, as well. But we, we don't always think about that in terms of the investment. And so we also sort of think, well, what's the point if we're going to have to move in a generation or two? Well, that's um, additional time to develop your culture, to instill values uh, to the community members, the young people in your community uh, that will hopefully be transferable if they are forced to move over time. And so that's a, that's what I've been um, asked to, cons to consider even more so because in some respects, uh, even if we uh, look at Katrina as, again, an example of the first and second disaster, was the just response to allow people to go back to the Ninth Ward when there were still similar vulnerabilities that existed? Uh, but people wanted to go home. They wanted to come back home. Similarly, in the Pacific, the notion that there is a sort of um there, there's a, they're, on a t they're on a set clock, there's a timetable, their islands, especially the atoll nations, may be uninhabitable for, very, uninhabitable for various reasons. The just response is perhaps having an eye to migration, but also being able to stay grounded in their community and their cultures and, and, uh, and with the bones of their ancestors, which is often how they describe staying on their land. So I think, again, in this, no, the notion that we're sort of in the stage of, of extreme trade-offs, we need to be thinking very dynamically about how we talk about the just response and actually uh, understand that the near-term question of 50 to 100 years is quite different than the longer-term question about whether or not this place is viable. How do we keep people in place for, for their uh, opportunities to continue to, to live in, in place the way that they have historically? Um, and of course, again, there are a number of issues that are happening within the U.S. and that uh, communities that are, are being, um, uh, dis that are, are, that are, suffering or, or, or compromised because of uh, climate impacts, incessant climate impacts, and women of color are at the forefront of that. So I, I want to affirm that as well and say that that's an ongoing conversation that we have at the intersection of climate justice uh, and gender. Thank you, Maxine. Uh, yeah, I would also want to chime in and, and affirm that this is very much an issue in the United States. There was a good piece in Rolling Stone magazine recently on it called uh, Welcome to the Age of Climate Migration by Jeff Goodell, who just also published the book. Um, it's a great read, and I think when you think about uh, you know, even last year's 
hurricane season, you're looking at folks who are facing cyclical displacement. So you have Katrina survivors who moved to Texas who were then displaced by Harvey. You have um, migration from Puerto Rico um, going to Florida and New York, which are also very vulnerable to climate change. So those are all issues that we're going to have to face. Um, and, uh, and then in terms of speaking with communities, this is something that uh, – that I, I struggle with a lot too as a journalist is how to talk with people about, um, about what they're facing as an outsider and that knowing that this is something that I'm just writing about but has very personal you know, impact for them and their families. But uh, I think you know, if we're thinking about it and we're not the ones affected, Th they got to be thinking about these things too, and my my, you know, I find that often they are when I ask those hard questions. They are thinking about it, and um, and I think it does justice to communities to be able to have the most difficult conversations because they should really be at the center of those. Um, and so I really appreciate that you're you're thinking about those things <laughs> with them. Yes. I, I just also wanted to affirm that and say that there are some amazing groups in the U.S. who are working on this issue, indigenous groups and um, p women of color who are leading. I mean, you may know of Jackie Patterson, who works with the NAACP, and she's done quite a bit of work on this mobilizing and movement building and trying to make more visible what's um, what's happening, especially on the Gulf Coast and some other places. And so I think you know, it'd be great to think about different ways to partner between the academic institutions that are thinking about this work from a research perspective with the grassroots groups in the U.S. and even with some of us then who are working at the international level to clarify what are these interlinkages and how does it get more space and time so that they're the people on the panel up here talking about what's happening in the U.S. Thanks, and, you know, and I'll just um, say that... Uh, uh, it's not something I know a lot about, but Jessica mentioned it in the blog post that she wrote the concept of migration with dignity and sort of moving from just not just planned relocation, uh, but even to the concept of approaching it, uh, you know, at, with dignity, with, with full involvement and engagement. So I think there may be something there to look into. Um, and then the other thing is I, the Sierra Club, uh, you mentioned Puerto Rico, the Sierra Club is working on um, some videos around looking at women in Puerto Rico and their response. And, uh, and I think it is incredibly important to connect what's happening in the U.S. to overseas. This is something that we experience that we will share. We'll share it differently. Um, but in those differences, there's a lot of, 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 of information that we can, we can use and, and assistance we can provide um, across those differences. So uh, I think it's very hard though, because people, um, it's, it's shocking uh, sometimes to me to talk to people who've never thought about the connections between women and climate change, because I think about them a lot, but really most people don't, and they don't know. So any way that you can start to connect it to your, to your own life or to your own experience or to those of your neighbors or your colleagues is going to bring those people one step closer to understanding it. Um, so thank you for raising that. Uh, more questions. Who else? Uh, up here in the front. One in the back. Let's start with the one right there in the back and then up front. Hi, my name is Audrey Anderson with Mercy Corps. And I wanted to follow on. I wanted to follow on to the the questions about migration. And given the reality of migration outside of the climate stresses that we're facing, and and also just the right of migration as for, for labor or for moving for other purposes, how do you really how do you approach differentiating between this type of migration and then also migration as a negative coping mechanism or the type of migration that you're trying to really curb? And I, I love what you just said about migration with dignity. And outside of numbers around migration, how are you measuring progress around achieving resiliency um, given the reality of migration often as perhaps even the only coping me mechanism that exists? Thanks. And let's take this uh, one question up front at the same time. Hi, um, I'm Monica Dehan Bose. I'm actually um, a lawyer who's left a lot of focus on art, um, to use art as a way of um, empowering people on climate. And my question is, um, two questions. One is, I'm doing um, a lot of research um, and um, um, adaptation work in a community in Bangladesh, and so what are the best practices in terms of making sure that women are being 
compensated for their time. So I'm finding it's a big struggle for me. I've been told that if I'm doing video-based research, I shouldn't be giving any money to them because then the research could be biased. On the other hand, there's time involved. So I feel, it's, so it's a complicated, so one, that one question is that. And the second question is, I feel um, quite overwhelmed, personally, dealing with um, these issues. Um, and I'm, a lot of the people that I'm uh, you know, collaborating with and working with are also feeling you know, so overwhelmed, <laughs> like we're drowning um, as we're working w with these communities. How do, you, how do you deal with that aspect of it? Great, so a rich set of questions. Migration is a coping mechanism. How do you measure resiliency? We had an event on that uh, in the fall on um, uh, data for resili measuring resilience, um, so the, uh, but there was a lot there. Um, uh, the ethics of, of paying people for their time in journalism, that's a good video, that's a great question, and also how do you sort of stay engaged um, when these issues are so big? Anybody wants to start? <laughs> Maybe I'll uh, start with the question on the issue of migration because as you know, I am, and I mentioned earlier on, the, the, at the intergovernmental level, they are negotiating this um, document, uh, which um, for for uh, for um, it's called a global compact for a safe, orderly, and regular migration. So you can, by the, by by that title, you can already sort of picture what they are thinking about uh, the go at the governmental level. But they had a first round the the the. Um, Basically, um, it's a very tricky <laughs> issue, let's just say, and uh, there was an, uh, another compact which was on refugees, uh, and they are trying to make the distinction at the government, at the level of governments, but we know uh, from the people who are working on this issue on the ground that the distinction is really difficult to make. And in the context of the Global Compact on Migration, they even want to look at the regular migration. So again, narrowing it down, and, and so all of these questions, um, in the f after the first set of negotiations last week, um, was that last week? Yeah, last week, there were questions around how do you differentiate uh, between regular and irregular? Uh, fr it was, is it from the intention side or uh, from, from the driver's side? So uh, just to give you a picture that it's also not very clear even at the level of the government. Um, and then an issue, just um, about the part of it over, Overwhelming. It is overwhelming for all of us, uh, just to mention that. But um, we, we take it as it comes, and we really do like uh, what um, Eleanor has presented, even if it's just a small piece of work at the community level, one community to community. It's the same for us. Even at the UN, we can't really do a lot of big things just because the issues have become s a lot, because we know more also. And we want to do more in terms of the addressing the multidimensionality of it. So then when you try to do that, it just becomes big. But we, we try to do anyway. I can chime mm -hmm. in too and, and just say a couple of things. Um, first, uh, with respect to migration as adaptation, I think we, you know, we really struggled with whether or not uh, describing it as adaptation is uh, sufficient or appropriate, there are a number of those who were anticipating having to migrate because of climate change or were in the process that saw it as an opportunity just to sort of sidestep the important mitigation that needs to happen in order for them to be able to stay in place. And so remembering that uh, migration as adaptation uh, normalizes migration in a way that makes it a, a probably easier to manage and a little less frightening, but at the same time normalizes it to the uh, detriment of those who would like to, to not have to contemplate that option, right, that don't want to see themselves on the table. So, well, we just have a, how many small islanders are, are there really? Why don't we just have them all move? Or how many communities at the coast that uh, have low value, for example, um, in terms of actual, you know, cost benefit analysis, why don't we just have those folks move? And so you run the risk of actually allowing migration to be normalized to a point where it uh, justifies um, 
the kinds of, of, of movements that may be uh, less voluntary uh, or less shared in terms of enthusiasm by community members themselves. Just a quick um, side note to that, that refers back to the question from the doctoral student. Places that want to uh, affirm the value of their location may you know, initiate public works projects to say, well, we really are important. We're bringing in tourism. We have this, uh, in terms of dollar value, we have this very valuable location. And so in some ways you have migration also encouraging um, activities that make you more vulnerable and recognizing when those 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 moments happen um, and trying to avoid them is, is going to also be critical. Um, with respect to how overwhelming the issue is, I, I agree, this is actually uh, so profoundly uh, c complex and uh, and I think we need to be able to commune on that and, and share that, especially with communities that are facing so many other immediate and, and massive threats as well. And what I tell um, my students and, and presumably everybody in, in the room is that we are at least in this position of privilege with respect to our ability to address the, the issue. And in some ways I celebrate the, the fact that I have an opportunity to work on that. And I hope that uh, that's certainly not going to buoy you in every day and every moment because it is truly huge, but the opportunity to do the work is is, I think a privilege in and of itself and that was sort of underscored for me as my mother who just turned 76 yesterday has uh, often felt completely um, uh, un unable to affect the change that she would like to see after 76 years and I, I, I agree there's difficulty for so many women in our uh, world to have that opportunity that voice but of course we have an opportunity and I think that's a that's a that's a place to uh, find um, solace and uh, strength at the same time. So that's certainly how I, I try to cope with that. Eleanor? Um, sure. Um, there have been so many great questions. I feel like it'd be great, ha wonderful to have this conversation continue longer. Um, I was thinking about migration as the negative coping mechanism and, and the challenge of identifying what kind of migration is it. And in the project that we did, the people in the communities weren't really able to identify exactly what the migration, what the cause of it was. Through some of the conversations, they, I think they started feeling a better understanding of the interlinkages that they were facing and what might be motivating migration of this family versus that family. Um, and I think just one of the challenges in terms of trying to stay in the place, because most of them did say they wanted to be in that community, that's where they felt comfortable. and. To, so how do you, a question I would have then is how do we continue to build the, the cultural values that would make the community strong if it had to migrate while still staying in place and addressing some of the economic um, issues that are there when, when drought's coming and you're facing hunger. I think it might be different when you're looking at sea level rise and there's an opportunity to, to deal with it in the moment, but then the, the more sort of basic necessity issues come to play as well. Um, I, one thing that we didn't really come to, and it was a question in the research that we were doing, was whether migration offers the opportunity to um, improve gender equality, to change gender relations. So for the women who move or the women who stay, based on who else is moving and staying in the community and where they're going, what is the impact? And I just wanted to leave it that we really need longitudinal studies that can actually follow, follow people, whether it's from a, a sudden disaster um, or the slow onset to understand why did they go? You know, they may give a different answer to the country they've gone to than the real answer of why they left home. And so it's important to be able to find a way to trace those people longer than the six months that um, the official data might after disaster. So I would welcome the academics out there to, um, to start a study on that. And I wanted to come back and leave one positive thing um, from my previous question about women's um, unpaid care work and and how we're sort of working with the power that we have and a program that the WIDU has in the climate negotiations is supporting women's capacity as negotiators on their government delegations. And so that's women who may be working in government or in NGOs, but they, they come and they understand the process and build their skills. And then through that greater understanding, they go back home and work at whatever level they are in the government to, to create change. So one woman then began um, a renewable energy project that had a gender perspective, which she wouldn't have done before. So it's about creating that change um, with the power that you have based on the support of the movement. We've reached the end of our time, but Justine, do you have a quick answer on the, the ethics of compensating people for their stories? Yeah, so that's a pretty big no-no in journalism. <laughs> um, so it's something I come across a lot. I think um, 
But I do think that there is power and healing in sharing your story, whether that's through art or um, a video or just sharing your story with someone else. And I hope that that's something that um, that people, um, you know, take something that's that's something they can take away from from um, being able to talk with us. And uh, yeah, I, I, we just have to find the the ones who are who are screaming to be heard because I, you know, uh, they're out there and just waiting, not waiting for us to listen, but um, yeah, I just, I think that there are really powerful stories and voices out there to be heard. I, I do have, there are examples of times when these stories, you know, have led to to funding that has helped the communities. Unfortunately, it's not usually immediate. It's not usually something you can directly site and it's certainly not something you can you know hand out at the time but you know in the bigger picture one hopes that makes a difference well thank you all very much it was an incredible discussion very rich wonderful questions and i as, as eleanor said we would have gone on for another two hours um but i hope we can continue this conversation online in person and follow up and as i said earlier the speakers do really have to run um, so uh, they will uh, be leaving out this door, and uh, if you don't get a chance to connect with them, you know, uh, please contact me, and we, and we can help put, put you in touch. Um, we will be uh, writing a summary of this event and uh, posting it along with the video, the archive videos your colleagues weren't able to attend or weren't able to watch will be able uh, to see, uh, to learn from all of these speakers. And I just want to also flag for you two events coming up. We have a lot in March, but uh, next week we have an event on climate and conflict. So please come and ask questions about women. Uh, and then we have an event on March uh, 22nd on the burden of care, which is another thing we talked about here today. Um, so please keep an eye out for, for those events. Thank you again to the Sierra Club and to my colleagues at uh, the Environmental Change and Security Program. And please join me in thanking our panelists and a special shout out to Maxine for sticking with us throughout it all. Thank you very much.